Welcome to the uh, Godhead Seminar. This is lesson two, and the title of this lesson is Godhead, and we're focusing on Logos. Uh, if you have watched or been a part of the first lesson, you've got a little feel to how this will go. It is uh, very scripture intense. Praise God. A lot of scripture. And uh, the reason being is because we desire to let the Spirit of the Lord wipe our hearts, minds, souls, spirits clean of all past influence and go back to the Word of God alone so that the Word of God can teach us uh, what what the Lord has to say through his word. So uh, a lot of scriptures, uh, some of them will, they'll be able to get on the screen. Some of them, they won't have time to do that. And please understand they're doing the best they can. Again, if you were not, if you have not seen or you were not here for last night's session, then this session is not going to be as beneficial to you. These lessons are sequential. Tonight is built on last night. Tomorrow night will be built on the first two nights. What that means is somehow, uh, if you really, if it really matters to you, somehow you're going to have to go back and watch last night and then catch up by watching this again and then Thursday night because... The word logos, of course, is the root word for logic. And God is logical. I know there are some that think that's not the case, but that's because that's because they don't know God. He's very logical. His word is very logical. And... Uh, the scripture says in Isaiah 28 that he teaches us knowledge line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. So all of God's impartation to knowledge, uh, of knowledge to us, each part is built upon everything else he's already given. So if you try to jump in the middle of that, without having the previous parts, it's not going to mean the same thing to you. It's not. So, just, I don't have time, much time for this, but just, just for a few moments, I hope, <laughs> uh, I, I want to do just a, a, a slight review so you'll, even if you were here or you've heard the lesson, uh, watch the lesson, that you'll be able to go from there. Uh, so, we started with Genesis 1-1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So, where did the, does the Bible begin? Where did God begin with the Bible? He did not begin with God. God was already there. So, the in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth was the beginning of creation, the beginning of time, and the commencement of the plan and the purpose of God. God was already there. He'd always been there. So who and what is God? Psalms 90 and verse 1 says, and the, the, the caption that you'll find in many Bibles, on each psalm it'll tell you basically who wrote it or who it was for or whatever. And uh, Psalms 90 is a prayer of Moses the man of God. There is the opinion by some that all 150 Psalms were written by David. They were not. This is one that was not. This was written by Moses. Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hadst formed the earth and the world. We talked about that last night. Most scholars believe that's not supposed to be redundant. It's earth and the universe. Even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. So from before the beginning of time, 
until and after t- there is no more time, there's nothing else but God, God is still there. And uh, He is the one true and living God. And He is infinite. That is a biblical word uh, in some translations. It is used once or twice in the King James. It is used in other translations much more frequently. And uh, it is... It, uh, a good synonym for infinite is limitlessness. Immeasurable. Not quantified or qualified. No words you can quantify it with. Even limitlessness, limitlessness in a sense limits it because it's using limits beyond limits as a Qualification. You see the difficulty. It's always difficult for the finite to define the infinite. Always. So, God says, I am. How did uh, Moses know about this God that he wrote of in Psalms 90? Exodus chapter 3, verse 4, uh, four I'm going to read quickly. Uh, you know the story probably, but I'm, I'm not, I can't read the whole story. I don't have time for a whole story tonight. You'll have to go back to the book for yourself and read the whole story. It's very interesting. Uh, verse 4, when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see God, the, the burning bush, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses, and he said, Here am I. And he said, Draw not nigh Hither, put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, God of Jacob. Moses hid his face. Verse 13. And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers hath sent me unto you, and they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. And God said, Moreover unto Moses. In other words, in addition to that, I'm going to qualify it a little bit more. Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, The Lord, and that's the Hebrew word, Y-H-W-H, which has been perverted by the addition of the vowels from the uh, Hebrew word Adonai as Jehovah. But in this case, the King James uh, translates it with all four letters of the word Lord capitalized to let you know it's not the Hebrew word Adonai, but it is the Hebrew unpronounceable tetragram, which is Y-H-W-H. The Lord, God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The word I am, tell them I am has sent you, is the the Hebrew word that means to exist. So I am simply is him declaring I exist. (laughs) Can you imagine a human being introducing themselves to somebody and saying, Uh, Let me tell you everything there is about me. I exist. It would be foolish for us to do that. But when God makes that statement, he tells us more than we will ever comprehend about him. But then he went a little bit farther with that statement. He said, I am that I am. And the Hebrew word there literally would be, I exist that I exist. While scholars can't really define this name, Y-H-W-H, the, uh, it has to be connected somehow to I am and I am that I am because both of those were called names by, in the context. What name shall I give them? Tell them I am has sent you. Tell them I am that I am has sent you. And then tell them, the Lord God of your fathers, the YHWH God of your fathers. 
It has to be connected. So this one true and living God who exists before all things and who created all things is known as the I am God. Any name of God that does not have an I am at its foundation is not a name of God. And there are some titles in the Bible that are used as names of God, and there can't be names of God because all names of God have I am as its roots, which we will see tomorrow night, that the only fully pronounceable name of God in our language is Jesus. It's the only fully pronounceable name. We will look at that in detail tomorrow night. Many times in the Bible, uh, God emphasized to mankind in both the Old and New Testaments that He is the I Am. The I Am is the, on, is the only one true and living God. That's, the, that's God. I Am. Well, don't, don't you have any other title? Any other title that you prefer over that one limits God. Every other title that's used in the Scripture if you make that the preeminent title, and the name Jesus is a name, not a title, any other title limits God. Father is limited. Son is limited. Holy Ghost is limited. Lord is limited. Christ is limited. All of those are limited in their scope and definition. So therefore, they cannot be names. Any name of God that does not have I am at its foundation, in its DNA, is not a name at all. And that is the message that God gave Moses in Exodus 3. But here, I don't have time to read all this, but just a few of them that are really they're all interesting, but this one, Deuteronomy 32, 39 says, See now that I, even I, am he, and there's no God with me. Isaiah chapter 43, verse 10 says this, Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. <laughs> oh, he's not done. I, even I, am the Lord. And beside me there is no Savior. I have declared and have saved, and I have showed when there was no strange God among you. Therefore ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, that I am God. Yea, before the day was, I am He. And there's none that can deliver out of my hand. I will work, and who shall let it? Thus saith the Lord your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. For your sake I have sent to Babylon, and have brought down all their nobles and, their, and the Chaldeans, whose cries in the ships, I am the Lord. Your holy one. I looked it up today. Exactly 50 times in the Bible is the title holy one used. There's no other title that has the word holy in it even found in the scripture. Not once. Holy one is found 50 individual times. Holy blank does not. It's not there. It doesn't exist. It's not a biblical term. Holy one is. 50 times he's called holy one. Zero times he's called holy anything else. Isaiah 44, 24. Thus saith the Lord, thy Redeemer, and he that formed thee from the womb. I am the Lord that maketh all things, and that stretcheth forth the heavens alone, that spreadeth forth the earth by myself. Isaiah 45, 18. You see, kind of get the idea that he's trying to make a point here. Isaiah 45, verse 18. For thus saith the Lord that created the heavens. God himself that formed the earth and made it. He hath established it. He created it not in vain. He formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is none else. 
Tell me and bring them near, yea, yea. Let them take counsel together who hath declared the, this from ancient time. Who, ha, who hath told it from that time? Hath, have not I the Lord? And there is no God else beside me. A just God and a Savior. There is none beside me. Now if I'm going to take the right hand business, literally, i got to take this statement literally too. If I'm going to take the right hand statement literally, that means there's two. Then I've got to take this statement literally too, which he says there's none beside me. So what does that mean? There's contradiction in the Bible if that's literal. If the right hand stuff is literal, then there's contradiction in the Bible. Look unto me and be ye saved all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is none else. I have sworn by myself the word has gone out from my mouth, out of my mouth in righteousness, and shall not return, that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall swear. How about Isaiah 48, verse 12? Hearken unto me, O Jacob and Israel, my called. I am he. I am the first and I am the last. Heard that anywhere before? That's an exact quote of the book of Revelation. How many first and last can there be? Hmm. How about John 8, 22? I said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins. If you believe not that I am he. I need that one on the screen. I'm going to wait on you. There you go. I said therefore, and this is, this is John 8, uh, 24. I said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins. For if you believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. Oh, if you have a printed Bible, you'll find that the word he is in italics, which means the translators were being transparent that the word was not in the original Greek, and they added it because they thought it belonged there. Because they couldn't bring themselves to translate. <laughs> I said, therefore unto you that you shall die in your sins, for if you believe not that I am, You shall die in your sins. They couldn't bring themselves to translate it like that. Even though the Greek was literally like that, and they were honest enough about it to admit by the italicized H-E that they added that because they just couldn't bring themselves to do it. But they did do it for whatever reason. In Isaiah 58, begin with verse 50, or Isaiah 8, beginning with verse 56. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet fifty years old. How hast thou, and hast thou seen Abraham? Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I said unto you, before Abraham was. Now, how many I am's can there be? One. How about Revelation 1, 17? When I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he said, he laid his right hand upon me and saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. Oh, didn't we hear somebody in Isaiah say that? I am he that liveth and was dead. Behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. Have the keys of hell and of death. And finally, Revelation 21, verse 6. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega. The beginning and the end. And I will give unto him as thirst of the fountain of water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things. And I will be his God. And you shall be my son. The I am is the only one true and living God. Jeremiah 10.10. 10. But the Lord is the true God. He is the living God. And an everlasting king. How about 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9? For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and, the tr and true God. If he's saying the living and true God, then there are obviously gods that are not true gods. 
And there's obviously gods that aren't alive. <laughs> and if you got a God that's alive but he's false, I guess that's better than one that's dead. But the worst you could be off is to have a dead false God. There's only one true and living God. So, <clears throat> here we go. All that was foundation. Wasn't that a wonderful foundation? I, I'd enjoy myself just going on a while with that. Um, the I am God had a problem. You can gasp now, but when I get through with the scriptures, you can take your gasp back. I'm going to prove it. The AI, I am God had a problem. What was his problem? He was alone. How do we know it was a problem for him? He told us. Where? In the Bible. God made man in his image and after his likeness. Now, these, there's several verses here, and I'm not going to read them all, but I, I have to read enough of it so you get the point. Because this is a big point. Because a lot of folks that say, well, if God is self-existent, he's self-contained. Well, if he's self-contained, what are you and I doing here? What in the world was he thinking Creating us if he's self-contained. Self-existent and self-contained is not the same thing. And there's no place that I can find that he is self-contained. In fact, one thing that he decided was he didn't want to be alone. But listen to this. I'm going to start with the creation story in chapter 5, not chapter 1. Because here's a summary. Genesis chapter 5, verse 1. This is the book of the generations of Adam. In the day that God created man, in the likeness of God made he him. Male and female created he them. And he blessed them and called their name, not his name, called their name Adam. In the day they were created. Well, when did Eve get the name Eve? After sin. Who named Eve? Not God. Adam named her. Before sin, her name was Adam. Because they were one. So Genesis... <laughs> I'd love to, but I'm not staying there a while. No, 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 no. That's why it's easier to teach this stuff to a camera than a crowd. Because there's some of you would like to stay there a little bit. Not happening. No, not tonight. Genesis 1, And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And so there's where the people get the plural. It might be noted that this is the only verse that uses the plural out of about 50 million verses. That's an exaggeration. Uh, every other verse where it talks about God creating, it's singular. Well, why would this be the case? That's really simple. You go to the book of Job, Job tells you the sons of God or the angels. Sons of God came before the throne of God. That's what they were named one time, and, and Lucifer came also. And the, but then later on in the, in the book of Job, it says, and the sons of God were present and rejoiced at creation. So the Lord, in his magnanimous way, said, let us. And they didn't do a thing. They watched. How do we know that? Verse 27, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. So there are three singular pronouns right there, right? And God blessed them and God said, be fruitful, multiply, and plenish the earth, subdue it, and have dominion. Now, verse, uh, chapter 
uh, Genesis 2, 18, the Lord brought it up. The Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a help me for him. You can't find any place where Adam said, I'm lonely. All of these animals, there's at least two of them, and they look different somehow. But I don't understand all that difference because there's only me. He didn't go to God with that. God came to him and said, It's not good for man to be alone. I will make and help meet for him. Not help mate. The Hebrew is not help mate. It's help meet. In the Hebrew there is the other half of yourself. And for those of you, I can't help myself. For those of you men that think there's something wrong with your wife because she's different than you, it worked. God succeeded. He made the opposite of you. Get over it. <laughs> Genesis 2. <laughs> Sorry. Back on the subject now. Genesis 2. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. And they both were, and they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Adam was a prophet. How do I know that? He didn't have a father or a mother. How did he know what a man was supposed to do when he got married? So Genesis chapter 3 verse 20, and Adam called his wife's name Eve. Now what does that all have to do with us? 1 Corinthians 15, 42. And so it is written, the first man Adam was made a living soul, the last man Adam was made a quickening spirit. The first man, Adam, is of the earth, earthy. The second man, Adam, is the Lord from heaven. As is the earthy, such are, are they also which, that are, are earthy. And as the, is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. As we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. So Adam was created in the image and likeness of God. He had feelings that mirrored God's feelings. And God said of the one he created, it's not good for you to be alone. What was going on there? God revealed his plan. He revealed his motivation. What do these scriptures prove? These scriptures prove that God had a need. What was that need? His need was he had no way to manifest himself. Well, why would he need to manifest himself? He had no way to get glory. <laughs> when it comes to God and God's glory, several uh Reference works say the Greek word there's talking about, and both and the Hebrew word is talking about the self manifestation, the self revelation of God. So if there's only God, then God can't have any glory because He gets no glory revealing Himself to Himself. And how do you reveal yourself to yourself when you're not hidden from yourself? Because glory or manifestation or revelation is uncovering what's hidden, making known what's unknown. God could not manifest himself to himself or reveal himself to himself because he wasn't hidden from himself. So therefore, he had no way to be glorified. He could not manifest himself and his, his love by loving himself. There's no place in the Bible 
that even remotely comes close to saying that I have been able to found, find in many hours of study that even remotely implies that God loves himself. I don't mean by saying that that he doesn't love himself, but he understands that love is not about self. Love is what you get. It's not what you give, you receive. And the agape word that's, defi- that's the Greek word for God is love isn't about what you get at all. It's about the privilege of giving. And if God is love and there's no one to give to, then can he, be, can he really be love if he's got no one to love? Because every definition I've ever read of the Greek word translated agape, God is agape. He's not eros. He's not not, uh, um, filio. He is agape. Filio is, is emotional. Agape is not emotional. It's a decision. It's a decision to put somebody else ahead of yourself. It's a decision to do for somebody else. It's not loving someone so you get love back. Because the very, the very act of loving is expressing what love is. Because he loved the whole world. He doesn't get it back from the whole world. But it's still his love. Whether man has believed it, received it, or returned it, he still loves the whole world. Whether they feel it, deny it, Feel lonely, rejected, doesn't make any difference. He still loves them because that's what love is. Freely you have received, freely give. So love is freely giving. Actually with no thought of return. So if love, if love is fu- fundamental to God's nature, and foundational of his eternal character, then there's no part of God that's more important to be manifested or expressed than love. This is lengthy. I'm going to read it because it's important. 1 John chapter 4, verse 7. But let us, beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. But he that he that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. (laughs) I don't know how you explain that statement away. I don't know how you explain that statement away. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. In this was manifested the love of God toward us. See, there's manifested love. He couldn't manifest his love to himself Manifest, again, is a a synonym of reveal. It's to make something known that was unknown. It's to show something that's unseen. And this was manifested the love of God toward us because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. Herein is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. You get that? (laughs) God wanted to love us whether we ever loved him in return or not. Now, the fool has said in his heart there is no God. So if I'm not a fool and I know there's a God and I realize he did all this first and foremost because he loves me, why would I not want to return what he's given me? We'll find that here in just a moment. Verse 10. Here in his love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. No man hath seen God at any time. Has ever, will ever. The the infinite I am God is invisible to time and space. Has always been, will always be. Don't get upset about that. I got good news for you in a little while. 
There is a plan, you see. There is a plan. <laughs> no man has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. Hereby know we that we dwell in him and he in us, because he hath given us of his spirit. Don't forget that one. And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent his Son in, uh, to be the Savior of the world. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him, and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. We have known experientially, not intellectually. We know it experientially. It's not a concept we talk about. It's a testimony we give. I'm loved. And we believe. The word there doesn't mean to give mental assent to. The word believe there means I put my full trust in his love. His motives toward me are perfect, even when I don't understand them. There's no accusation I can make against his motives because he loves me. We have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God. And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love. That's the second time it's said just these few verses. And he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God and God in him. Herein is our love made perfect that we may have boldness in the day of judgment because as he is so are we in this world. There is no fear in love. But perfect love casteth out fear because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. We love him. We have no ability to love him because the only source of agape is God. Filio is human. My mother held me as an infant. She invested filio in me. So over a period of time, you kind of learn to give that back to others. But I have no source of agape but God. We love him because he loved us. He first loved us. And then Really quickly, I've got to read this because so, it's some of my, uh, my favorites are Genesis 1, 1 through uh, Revelation 22, 21, but some of them just kind of stick out every once in a while, right? Romans, Romans 5, verse 1, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. And rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. And hope maketh not a shame. Why? Because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given to us. Isn't that kind of what it sounds like in 1 John 4, 13? Hereby we know, know we that we dwell in him, and he in us. Because he hath given us of his spirit. Oh yeah. All things were made by God. But why were they made? You ready? If this was said about a human, there'd be a problem. But this is said about God, and he's telling you exactly what he did it. Proverbs 16, 4. The Lord hath made all things for himself. Revelation 4, verse 11, standing or kneeling before the throne in the throne room of heaven, casting our crowns at his feet. This is what we're going to say together. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. The Amplified says that verse this way, for you created all things by... By your will, they were, they were brought into being and were created. We six expanded translation says it this way. Because as for you, you created all things. And because you willed it, they existed and were created. The Rotherham emphasized Bible says it this way. Because thou didst create all things and by reason of thy will, they were and were created. Everything is created for his purpose. He has a purpose. He has a plan. I believe the Bible clearly teaches 
that it was because he wanted to love and be loved. Now, if that's not his motive, can you think of a better one? In, First Corinth, or in Ephesians chapter 1, Paul prayed for the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him to, to, be, to come on the church. Why? Because of the things the, the, that Paul was praying for us to know because of the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him were two things. So let me read it first and then we'll point them out. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 17, I'm reading all of it, uh, dear brother on the computer. Verse 17, and I'm reading fast. <laughs> that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe according to the work of his mighty power which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him in his own right hand in the heavenly places. Far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named. Not only in this world, but in that which is to come. And hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church. Which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Two of God's desires what he's wanted to get out of all this is contained here. He didn't say that he wants us to know what is the riches of our inheritance in him. He wants us to know what is the riches of his inheritance in the saints. What is he getting out of this? Bible Basic English translates that verse this way. He wants us to know what is the wealth of the glory of his heritage in the saints. The Living Bible says, I want you to realize that God has been made rich because we are who, we who are Christ have been given to him. The uh, we translation says that we're supposed to know, or he wants us to know what is the wealth of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Weymouth's New Testament says that we would know what the wealth of the glory of his inheritance in God's people. And then here's the one that is amazing. The last one. The last verse in the King James reads, which is his body, the fullest of him that filleth all in all. Weasley reads it this way, which is of a such a nature as to be his body, the fullness of the one who constantly is filling all things with all things. Wait, 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 wait. I thought he was full. No, there apparently is a, place he's wanting filled oh let's keep going it's it really is what it says in the Greek the translations agree with this Weyman says it means the completeness of him who everywhere fills the universe with himself the church is his body which is the completeness of him who everywhere fills the universe with himself God's word translation says it this way the church is Christ's body and completes him as he fills everything in every way. The complete Jewish Bible 2016 version says, which is his body, the full expression of him who fills all creation. And then finally, the Good News translation says, the church is Christ's body, the completion of him who himself completes all things everywhere. Did you get it? He, I don't want to use the word physically because, well, it's not metaphysical either. I mean, except we, whatever metaphysical means, we can't explain him by our yardsticks, time and space. We can't explain him that way. So he's outside of that. He's outside of our ability to define him that way. So, he's there. He exists. But there was something he needed. There was something he wanted. Well, how long was he in existence when that happened? I don't have any idea. 
Because the word long is a measurement and you can't measure God. Somehow, some way, I don't know. He doesn't tell us how. He just tells us the fact that happened. He decided to do all this. And he didn't do it because he was bored and had nothing else to do. He wanted to be completed. And what he needed to be needed so he could be completed was he needed to be able to manifest himself to someone and to receive glory, meaning to be able to reveal and manifest himself to to them so that they could see him as he is. You know, I don't like everything about me, and I'm sure, well, I, I shouldn't speak this for you, but I'm hoping that you're normal that you don't like everything about you. Right. (laughs) But it's not that God didn't like everything about himself. Somewhere, somehow, he decided something was missing. And the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him that's going to enlighten our hearts with light so we can see and know, one of the three things we're supposed to know is the exceeding riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints. In other words, to Him, what He's going to get from us is riches beyond imagination from His perspective. And he's not talking about us giving money. He's talking about us giving ourselves to him because we acknowledge he's given himself to us. Which is the principle of the gospel, is it not? Freely you've received. Freely give. Mm. So all things were created by God for himself. Colossians 1.16, I'm reading all these verses if you don't mind. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and, and invisible, whether they be thrones or dimensions, principalities or powers, all things were created by him and, what's those last three words? And for him. He is before all things, and by him all things it consist. And he is the head of the body of the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all the fullness dwell. And then finally, these words are so poetic and they're so deep. Romans chapter 11, they, they are so, they're one of those, Verses and or sets of verses that you like just to go through your mind because there's something about them that is just that just have an impact on you even if you can't define that impact. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgment and his ways past finding out. That's not a taunt. That's not him saying, nah, nah, you can't know me. That's him saying, no matter how much you know, no matter how much you want to know, no matter how much you pursue me, no matter how much you desire me, you don't ever have to run, worry about running out of me and coming to the end of me. Oh, the depth of the riches, most of the wisdom and the knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord or hath been his counselor? Who hath first given to him and it shall be recompensed unto him again? For of him and through him and to him are all things. For of him and through him and to him are all things. To whom be glory forever. Amen. Again, why has God done all this? I believe that the Bible teaches that God is self-existent. But again, I can't find anywhere it teaches that he is self-contained. I believe that that fact, the fact that we are here at all, demonstrates his need 
and that he is not self-contained. You are the proof. We are the proof that God is not self-contained. You didn't get yourself here. (laughs) It wasn't your idea to be born. You may take things out of God's hand and try to decide when to die, but you can't decide when to be born. You can't decide when egg and sperm come together. You can't decide when breath comes into the nostrils and man becomes a living soul. You don't have that power. So someone else was behind all of this. If love is the most fundamental element of his nature and character, then love could never be fulfilled by loving self. Never. So therefore, he needed us. But the problem is this, and it's a problem. You see, love is a choice. That means if who or what he's loving doesn't have a choice, they can neither choose to receive the love and they certainly can't choose to return it. The entire universe was created as the environment in which he would place someone who had the ability to choose. Well, he created two types of beings with the ability to choose. Living beings, one were were the angels. The difference between angels and humans is that angels were created with the ability to choose, but were not given the right to choose. They had ex access to the most intense manifestation of God in the universe, the heaven of heavens, and his throne at the center of all that. And they could come and go, apparently, in that atmosphere of manifestation of God's glory. But having that kind of access, they were given the ability to choose. They were not given the right to choose. And it only took one wrong choice for one-third of all the angels to be completely eliminated from God's plan forever. When God created the heavens and the earth, hell was already there. From the beginning of the creation of the earth, there was hell at its depths. Why? Because Matthew 25 says that hell was created for the devil and his angels. It wasn't created for humans. Everybody that goes to hell, is, every human that goes to hell is an unwelcome guest. It's not your place. Wasn't created for you. So therefore, since angels were created with the ability to choose but not the right to choose, one choice, it was done for them and there's no redemption. There's no forgiveness, there's no sacrifice, there's no way of undoing it. So when God created a being, that not only had the ability to choose, but the right and responsibility to choose. He didn't make us out of the substance, his own substance. Angels are spirit beings. He took all this power, this ability to choose, and wrapped it in the weakest of elements to mediate the negative effects of wrong choices. He wrapped it all in flesh. And even with that mediation or moderation or limiting of the impact of wrong choices, the Lord looked down at Babel, said, we're going to have to go down and do something about that because there's nothing that they imagine to do they can't end up doing. That's the kind of power that humans have been given. I know right now in this life, in this situation, we feel powerless. And if there's anything a human being wants to be is in control. Because being in control is the most godlike thing you can be and do. That's why we're not in control of anything. And the greatest deception that any human being lives in is that he's trying to control, he, she, is trying to control something. I can't even control my own heart, make it keep beating. 
I don't have the power to retain life and death. Ecclesiastes says that. I don't have control. I have the ability to choose, but I don't have the ability to control. And that's the test, you see. Because in knowing God, understanding God, having a relationship with God, receiving the benefit of His forgiveness for my wrong choices, which He provided from before the foundation of the world, because He was the Lamb that was slain in the plan of God before the foundation of the world, before He ever created man in His plan. He already had the plan of redemption available to redeem man from wrong choices. That's what love did. Love just didn't put us here and say, good luck. Love said, here, I'm doing everything I can to help you. What are you going to do about it? Okay, so you've made wrong choices. You don't have to live with those choices for eternity. The Lamb of God came to take away the sins of the world. This is what his love did. This is what his love provided. But how did he do that? How did an infinite I am God do all of that? The bottom line is, by himself, he couldn't. Not in his existence as I am outside of everything that's finite. So the I am had to come up with a way, and he didn't wring his hands over it because he didn't have hands. He didn't have any sweat on his brow because he didn't have a brow. His heart didn't speed up. His blood pressure didn't spike because he didn't have any of that either. But he determined how he could take his fullness of quality into the limits of time and space. And while the fullness of his quantity can't be in time and space, that's pretty obviously why. Because if he's greater, and there you go with a limiting word again. There I go with a limiting word again. Now, you can't use words like that with God because <laughs> he's limitless. But since he's limitless in time and space, the universe is limited Limitless cannot come into limitless directly because one of two bad things is going to happen. <laughs> Either the limitless one will completely instantaneously obliterate the limited or if he truly limited himself in time and space directly as the I am God, then he and everything else would cease to be. Because the definition of who he is is, I exist. There's no other measurement or limitation on him, but I exist. I exist. So the Lord needed to express himself as an intermediary, a conduit, an interface. And I'll give you the definition of that. An intermediary is a person who acts as a link between people in order to bring about an agreement or reconciliation. A mediator. A conduit is an agency or means of access communication. Or how about this modern term, interface. Dictionary.com says interface is a thing or circumstance that enables separate and sometimes incompatible elements to coordinate effectively. Webster says something that enables separate and sometimes incompatible elements to coordinate or communicate. But here's the, here's the thing. The Logos wasn't separate than the I Am. It is the I Am. The Logos is the I Am expressed in the fullness of all of His qualities and characteristics into time and space. He just couldn't bring the fullness of his quantity, which 
is unlimited in time and space. Now, the problem we have is this. Man has wanted to take this logos and make it separate from the I am. The problem you've got is this. There's only one God. That's the I am. The moment you separate I am from the nature and the substance and the characteristic and the identity of logos, it ceased, logos ceases to be God. Well, how can the limitless one come into time and space? That's what I'm telling you. He did that and called it logos in the Greek. Now, the Lord, the Lord did his best to, and I don't mean that critically like he failed, uh, but... If anybody knows we're finite, he does. (laughs) We may not know we're finite. Some of us think we're immortal and infinite. Omniscient, omnipresent, and all the above. I got really bad news for you. You're not. Okay? But that being the case, he tried to explain... The Logos in terms we would understand. So Hebrews chapter 1 verse 1. God who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. Hath in these last days spoken unto us by. You see that word word his right there? It's not in the Greek. And if you have a very reliable Bible study software, you can find that's the case. And some translations actually try to be totally true to the Greek text there by not putting the word his in there. Do I have a problem with the word his there? Nah. As long as you don't understand that that separating logos expressed as a relationship called son from God. Hath in these last days spoken to us by his son or by son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Here we are now. This is the best you can do in time and finiteness or finiteness to explain the infinite projected into time and space. Who being the brightness of his glory, and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Now the Amplified says it this way, but in the, la- in the last of these days, he has spoken to us in the person of a son, or the Logos made flesh, whom he appointed heir and lawful owner of all things, also by and through whom he created the worlds and the reaches of space and the ages of time. He made, produced, built, operated, and arranged them in order. He is the sole expression of the glory of God. The light being the outraying or radiance of the divine. He is the perfect imprint of the very image of God's nature. Upholding and maintaining the guiding and propelling, uh, uh, maintaining and guiding and propelling the universe by his mighty word. And for time's sake, I'm going to move on to verse 5. For to which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son, today have I begotten you, established you in an official sonship relation with kingly dignity? And again, I will be to him a father, and he will be to me a son. Now, Weiss tries to be, Weiss gets wordy because it, he's trying to translate all the nuances of the Greek word, which doesn't really make it easy to read. So, this is what Weiss' expanded translation says in verse 2. In the last of these days spoke to us in one, 
who by nature is his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he constituted the ages, who being the outraying or effulgence of his glory and the exact reproduction of his essence and sustaining, guiding, and propelling all things by the word of his power. And then verse 5 he says, For to which of the angels did he say at any time, Son of mine, you are, I this day have begotten you, and again I will be to him as a father, and he himself shall be to me as a son. The Greek word translated express image, this is the only place place the, the words found anywhere in the Greek New Testament. And it's spelled the Greek letters, and I'm not pronouncing them as Greek letters. I'm pronouncing them as English letters, but this is the corresponding English letters to the Greek word. C-H-A-R-A-K-T-E-R, from which we get the English word character. But the word means, according to Strong's, a graver, the tool of the person. And by implication, engraving, the figure stamped an exact copy, or figuratively, an exact representation. Now the exeg—I uh, can't say it. Exegetical ex- 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 dictionary of the New Testament says it this way concerning the Greek word character. Thus, Christ alone, the Logos made flesh, is viewed as the reflection of the divine glory and as the one imprinted by the divine reality. By God's essence. And then finally, Thayer's Greek lexicon says it this way. The word means the exact expression or the image of any person or thing, a marked likeness or, ready, the precise reproduction in every respect. In other words, the only difference between the I am and his expression of himself into time and space is quantity, not quality. Now, that does not make him a, another God. What that makes him is all of God that's possible to be a part of the limited universe called time and space. In fact, scientists today call the universe a time-space continuum. That's their terminology. Because it doesn't matter whether we have the ability to measure the universe, it's measurable. Our inability to currently measure the full dimensions of the universe has nothing to do with whether or not it's limited. It has everything to do with, say, to, 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 with saying how limited we are. Now, here's another one of those that I've used a lot. Some of you will heard, have heard this before. And I will keep reading where I usually stop. Second Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. How? In the face of Jesus Christ. That's why Romans 8.29 says that we're created in the image of His Son. Colossians 1.15 says that He is the image of the invisible God. Colossians 3 and verse 10 says that we are renewed in the knowledge after the image of Him that created Him. He is the image of God. So Colossians 3.15, 
and 2 Corinthians 4 and 4 use the another Greek word for image that's also in Romans 8.29 and Colossians 3.10 and other places. And it means, nope, there it is. It means a likeness, literally a statue, profile, figuratively a representation or resemblance. So he is, now this is the, the point. How does an invisible God have a likeness? So it can't be talking about a picture or a statue or a painting that represents what God looks like. So the, the exact duplication has to be all of those qualities that make God God except for his limitlessness. Why? Because the unlimited God cannot be a part of time and space or anything going on in time and space. Or let's go even farther back than that. The unlimited God can't even create time and space, which is limited, directly, without limiting himself. So he had to do it. He had to have a conduit. He had to have an agency. He had to have an expression of himself that could be a part of time and space, that could bring time and space into existence without limiting God as the I am. And I'm making a statement to you right now that you will have to come back tomorrow night to hear explained and Scripture proven. But every single title in the Bible that's used in reference to God is simply God trying to explain one part of how He's operating. Because there's only two parts of God. The part outside of time and space and the part of God that can be a part of time and space. Oh, praise God. <laughs> All right. So let's go on. Uh, so, here we go again. Last night it was Genesis 1-1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So tonight... We're talking about logos. So John 1.1. One, one. You'll have to skip down there a little bit. Brother, thank you. Trying to save some time and don't have much time left to save. John 1 and 1. In the beginning was the Word. The Greek word there is logos. And the Word, logos, was with God. And the Word, logos, was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him and without Him was not anything made that was made. Why? Because the I am could not directly cre create the finite without limiting himself. So the first thing, in fact, the Bible says in Revelation that Christ, or the Logos, was the beginning of the creation of God. Why? Because the first thing God had to do was to express himself in this agency of his that was, go was going to allow him to be a part of time and space, and that it same agency is what he used to work through to create time and space. That's why everything was created by Logos. Word. We call it Word. That's so debasing Logos to translate it just as Word because it's everything. The plan of uh, God, the purpose of God, the will of God, the counsel of God, the wisdom of God. Every one of those words and any word like that is all an element of what logos is. The plan of God. Purpose of God. The mystery of God. It's all a part of logos. So then we're skipping down. I wish that we didn't have to, but we're going to. Verse 14. And the word logos was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Oh, let's look at this now, verse 18. No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. Hmm. Imagine that. 
there was an inkling of this coming, which is called Isaiah 96. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Just a hint. Well, who's the father? You ever heard of the I am? The father is the I am expressing himself through logos into time. The only deity you will ever read the Bible saying was in the Son of God, in Christ, in Logos, was the Father or God. God or Father. Of course, they're one and the same. There's no verse in the Bible that attributes any deity residing in the Son slash Christ but the Father. It's not in there. Was the Lord Jesus Christ God? Yes, he was and is. And what made him God? The Father. The I Am. Expressed through the Logos. Oh, I got to go on here. Time is gone. Hallelujah. I'm skipping, skipping. <laughs> All right. There's one I'm trying to find here. I want to get to it. If you will just be watching for me here. Let me give you, this is what's really good. You ready? This is what's really awesome. You want a perfect picture of Logos? And I am, let's go after time. Let's go after the millennial kingdom. To Revelation 21, verse 22. It's under Christ and the Lamb, God and Christ, the Lamb in heaven, if you can get down to that. Revelation 21, 22. And I saw no temple therein in New Jerusalem. For the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. Huh? The Lamb is the body of the man Christ Jesus that's been ascended into heaven and is now the only visible representation of the I Am God in time and space forever. The I Am is invisible. You and I will never see the I Am because first of all, we're in time and space. We're limited. And what about eternity? Really? So you think eternity is timeless? It's not your soul eternity? E eternal? You know what that means? It just has no end. It had a beginning. It's not limitless. Angels are eternal. Demons are eternal. Punishment is eternal. Life is eternal for those that have it, or will have it. But everything eternal had a beginning. It just didn't have an end. The I am had no beginning. So he's not eternal, he's infinite. He's greater than eternal. Logos <laughs> is eternal. Because he was the beginning of the creation of God. Do I believe in the eternal sonship? I'd like to see that terminology in the Bible. Do I believe in the eternality of Logos? Let's hope. Because he's, everything's held together by the word of his power. By the Logos of his power. <laughs> so if there's no more Logos, we cease to be. You talk about a big bang? This won't be one that creates anything.
won't be happening. So if the Lord God and the Lamb are the temple of it, <laughs> that means with both the tabernacle and the temple, there was a building, a visible place you could see the house of God. And in the holiest of all, there was a manifestation of God. You couldn't necessarily see it. It was described as light, but there was no form, there was no shape. So forever, there's not going to be any church buildings, there's not going to be a, but one temple, it's not going to be a building. The body of the man Christ Jesus, the Lamb of God, is going to be the temple, and the, the, the Lord God Almighty is going to inhabit that temple so that, not, not obviously, you can't put all of God in, in a body a visible body. So he will simply be the visible representation of the God we all live and move and have our being in. Oh, I like this next one. Verse 23. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof, and the Greek word is lamp. (laughs) The Lamb... The body of the man Christ Jesus is the lamp, not the light. The source of the light is the one who manifests himself in and through the lamp. And there won't be a sun because the light, will. there won't be rays of light. That light will just fill everything. There won't be any darkness at all. I want to go there, don't you? Oh, The notes are going to be available after tomorrow night. So I am skipping. And I want to close with this, so I'm skipping some really, really, really good stuff. Okay. I'm down on knowing the Son is knowing the Father, Matthew 16, 15. And I know that it's eight minutes till, and I'm just turning that time off for these last few moments. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Matthew 16, 15, Jesus saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter. Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So the church wasn't built on Peter, but on the revelation of who Jesus is. But listen to this, Matthew 11, 25. It's similar terminology. At that time, Jesus entered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent. Now, I looked all that up, and I want to know who the wise and prudent were, because I didn't want to be them. And essentially, the wise and prudent are those who are pursuing God intellectually. That's, that's oversimplifying it, but that's what it means. Because I want to be a babe. Somebody that says, I can't figure out anything you want to tell me, I receive. At that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, the Lord of heaven and earth, Because thou hast hid these things for the wise and prudent, and hast revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. You ready? All things are delivered unto me of my Father. And no man knoweth the Son but the Father. Neither knoweth any man the Father save the Son. And he to whom so he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. There's another verse here. And I'm looking for it, but I... Oh, here it is. Okay. Uh, It says... See if this is familiar with you. Um, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. 
And the Greek preposition there for by, if I remember correctly, is the, is the preposition for agency or the channel of an act. In other words, logos is the conduit whereby and is the only way where I and you can get to the Father, can have communication to the Father, with the Father, relate to the Father. And, and, and Thomas, I think it was, said, well, show us the Father and it satisfies And Jesus said, have I been so long time with you and you don't know me? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He's not talking about resemblance. He's saying the Father is invisible because He's the I Am. And if you've seen me, this is the only Father way you're ever going to see the Father. Not only am I the only way you're ever going to see the Father, I'm the only way you're ever going to have access to the Father. Now, just before I quit, and wow, I got four minutes. I will use them wisely as soon as I find the verse. Ah, uh, here it is. John 16, 23. It's at right at the end, if you don't mind. John 16, 23, or you can just put it on the screen. In that day you shall ask me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whatsoever you shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it you. Hitherto have you asked nothing in my name, and you shall receive, that your joy may be full. Now, verse 25. I didn't write this. I didn't sneak it in your Bible. Jesus spoke it. It's only a few verses from the last thing he ever spoke in teaching to the apostles. Because that night, the next thing he did in chapter 17... He prayed for, the, for them, and then, then he went out to Gethsemane and prayed and was taken, and he was crucified that day, later that day. So this is one of the last things he says. These things have I spoken unto you in Proverbs, but the time cometh when I shall no more speak unto you in Proverbs, but I shall show you plainly of the Father. What? Jesus is telling us just before he's crucified that all this talk of father and son is proverbial. That it's terminology the Lord uses because he, he knows that limited mankind will understand it. I didn't put that word in there. In fact, it's in there twice. Now, I don't know why the King James translators chose at this time to translate a word that they've been translated parable time after time after time as proverb. But it's the same Greek word. And we know what a, a parable is. It's a natural illustration of something that is only illustrative in principle. So if I want to understand the parable of the sore, I know that evangelism is not going down to the feed store and buying a sack of feed and going out spreading seed on the ground someplace here. I know it's a parable. It's not to be taken literally. My job is to receive from the Spirit of God guidance in the truth of what reality needs to be substituted into the part of the parable that's sore, what reality needs to be substituted into the, into the part of the parable that's uh, that seed, that's ground, because I know it's not talking about a literal sower and a literal seed and literal ground. It's a, it's a metaphor, an allegory to explain to us spiritual things in terminology we would understand. And now the Holy Ghost, writing it down, quoting Jesus, just used the exact same word in reference to the Father. Why? Because it was only God's way of trying to help us understand something, help finite 
beings understand the infinite and the infinite's plan, the infinite's purpose, the infinite's efforts. It's a parable. Now, if you want to take it literally as father and son, please do yourself a favor, figure out a way to get that out of the Scripture. Of course, then your problem is you're taken away from the Word. Now you've got a curse on you for taking away from the Word. I'm not being facetious. I'm trying to drive home a point here in the last moments. All of this language is a parable. Because I am is supposed to be substituted in that equation, that parable for Father. And Logos is supposed to be substituted in that equation or that parable as Son. Because all of those parables and all that talking back and forth and explaining in our terminology was trying to help us understand the relationship between the I am and himself expressed in time and space. That's why Paul said, I, 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 I'm, I'm concerned lest you beguiled, be beguiled from the simplicity that is in Christ. You can't get any more simple or any simpler than the I am God. There's only one God. He's the I am. Any God that only exists in time and space <laughs> is a false God. Right. That's why the connection between Logos and the I Am is always there and will never not be there because to connect Logos from the I Am is undeifying Him. Because the only deity is the I Am. So the Logos is always the bridge, the interface, the mediator, the connector, the conduit that works both ways. For the I am to be able to communicate with time and space and for those who live in time and space to be able to communicate with the I am. And out of kindness to us, and understand the limitations he created us in, in time and space. And that everything that's in time and space can be seen. If you have the right equipment to see. So therefore, <laughs> I need to be able to have a means to communicate with him. And I'd like to see him. And I will see him. And he will be visible. Now, God will not be limited to the very spot where the body of the man Christ Jesus is, who is the head of the body. And he will be the head of the body forever. And as the head of the body... He is the visible representation of the I am God in time and space. Amen. So tomorrow night, we will go into all of this. I covered about 20 pages, and I have 50 pages of notes right here. If you're interested, they will be made available probably by Friday. Um, and the, no charge. We'll tell you exactly how to get them. And uh, I can't sell the word. I'm giving the word away because it was freely given to me. If you're interested in at least reading the notes and reading the scriptures you've missed or reading at your own speed rather than me trying to go 90 miles an hour, they will be available to you. In addition to that, there is a document that I have uh, put down what the Lord has taught me about how to, how to study the Bible to find truth. It's about 30 pages long, and uh, it will also be available at the same time that the three lessons are available. Uh, I had a 
interesting day. I had about 200 pages of notes I'd pared information down to, and then I was having to pray all day and decide what I couldn't cover and knowing that even what I came here to you, to you with, I wasn't going to get to that. So it was a very painful day because I would have loved to have brought all that and covered all that, but uh, I promised to be done by 9.30, and it's now, or 9 o'clock, and it's now 9.05. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for speaking to us. Thank you for the spirit of revelation that's been in this place. Thank you for your light that's shining in our hearts and minds, that we can know you. We want to know you. We want to know you. We want to fellowship with you. We don't want to worship an unknown God. We don't want to worship somebody we think we know or that we've created in our own minds as some kind of figure or concept that we worship. We want you and you only. We want the truth. And you have promised us, Father, that the spirit of truth would guide us into all truth. In Jesus' name, give us a love for the truth that will settle for nothing but the truth. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, bless us as we go. Bless everyone that has been a part of this, either here or watching online or will watch it later. Let the spirit of revelation abide on every one of us. In the name of Jesus, amen. God bless you. Thank you for being here.